Um, thanks also Vera, for uh, subtly indicating that I am getting old by asking me to do a history of glioma models uh, and also uh, telling me that I have to do it in 15 minutes. Uh, so challenge accepted and we'll try. If I can move my slides, which doesn't look like because the arrow, oh, right. there we go. Okay, so why do we need to study uh, models of gliomas when MR is translational and we can do everything on the patients? Well, first of all, if you have to develop any new drugs, uh, you can see this inverted arrow indicating uh, the cost uh, of doing a clinical study uh, from going blindly. Um, so obviously you need to do the studies in uh, in, in cells, in animals, and then to humans, that's the traditional pathway, that's how the regulators work. Uh, but also, with not only that, we know that GBMs are heterogeneous in nature. There are several subtypes, uh, age varies, um, uh, and gender also plays a, a, a role in it. And if you really want to do a control study, you can't really do it in that in patients. Um, I already mentioned developing uh, and testing drugs. So you need a model. Do you need a model to test that? And so the ideal model uh, in the ideal world would be the one that replicates the human tumor as closely as possible. And when I say that, in terms of growth rates, heterogeneity, metabolism, immune response, and, and so on and so forth, the list keeps going. So obviously uh, you cannot have uh, a silver bullet for everything. So you need to have uh, different models. So what are the different kinds of models? Uh, the most commonly used uh, throughout the world uh, is doing studies in vitro in cells. Now these could be in extracts uh, or perfused cells, could be spheroids, cold cultured uh, cells, uh, 3D organoids or, or tumoroids as we call them. And these are great tools uh, for understanding the basic uh, fundamental metabolism um, and, and the other concepts. However, as uh, you can see, uh, they have limited, limited translational values because you are just looking at cells per se. The second one, it is, uh, used to be much more common, at least in the GBM uh, community. Uh, it's less common these days, but it is growing, just putting the cells in the uh, subcutaneous regions of the animal, let, letting the tumor grow and doing the studies. Again, uh, great models for proof of concept studies, uh, developing numbers are uh, perfusion limited. That is, uh, they, the vasculature um, body ratio that is in humans uh, does not really translate here. Uh, as an example it is given of uh, um, with a subcutaneous tumor it would actually in, equate to almost a one and a half kilogram tumor in, in a human brain, which obviously will not be possible. Uh, orthotopic tumor models where you are actually injecting uh, the cells into the brain of the animal, much more closer uh, to what the tumors uh, are in patients. Uh, we, we heard some talks yesterday and these can be both syngenic as, as well as uh, patient-derived xenografts or PDX models. Um, if you're doing it in a syngenic line, that is the tumor line is derived from the animal strain itself, uh, the, you are incorporating the immune response. If you are doing a patient-derived cells, then you have to uh, grow them in nude mice or immune deficient animals. And so whilst you're able to study the human tumor in an animal, you are unable to detect or address the um, immune response. Uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, or laws uh, as well as costs are becoming prohibitive these days uh, and hence uh, also the NC3Rs which is uh, reduction, replacement and refinement of animal use uh, is also uh, led to um, using the chicken embryo um, CAM model uh, as an alternative. Uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. So coming back to, okay, what are these different uh, cell uh, models, especially the 3D organoids? 
that you can have the minced tumor tissue in growth culture and grow them. You can have bioprinted uh, organoids. You can have a cerebral organoid that are genetically engineered to grow GBM tumors, just like what happens in patients. Or you could have uh, a, uh, the um, organoids uh, co-cultured uh, with glioma cells. Um, these are, um, I won't say this is the history, this is the current uh, state of the art. Of course, we are not using MR for these uh, methods here because the MR is less sensitive. The animal models, on the other hand, uh, you, uh, coming to the orthotopic models, uh, I already uh, talked about these models where you inject uh, tumor cells into the animal brain. Uh, you can also have genetically uh, modified animals uh, where a particular gene, uh, TP53 uh, knockout, for example, uh, would lead to uh, growth of tumors, but then these are very, very hard to control and very, very expensive. And also uh, the tumor take rate is very variable. Uh, so uh, hence uh, not routinely used by the imaging community. And then uh, we already mentioned about the human tumor xenografts, uh, where you can take the patient um, tumor and develop a cell line from that, inject into that, or you can grow them as neurospheres. And, and obviously, every time you grow a tumor, you confirm them uh, with these uh, methods, uh, immunohistochemistry or fluorescence imaging, mobile immunosense imaging, or the endpoint if that is the survival. So what's the history of uh, these in, in, uh, in MR? Well, it starts with cell extracts. Uh, this was the easiest uh, and method of doing it. Uh, typically, the idea was, okay, uh, we see uh, these metabolic patterns in human cases, uh, what is the origin? And hence, uh, the cells from the rats were extracted. And this is the one of the earlier studies that actually demonstrated that NAA is uh, not only a neuronal marker, but undifferentiated oligodendrocytes also have NAA. Um, it's once they are differentiated, then you don't see that. Um, another study uh, in the um, late, uh, early 90s uh, showed uh, the differences in the metabolic uh, phenotypes of different glioma cell lines. Uh, one thing that you notice in most of these have a very high lactate peak. And that is not what you commonly see in humans and because the lactate peak is occurring due to the process of extraction. Um, so obviously that is not uh, a, a condition. And also by making extracts, you are, it's an invasive process, you are cr crushing the cells. So it, there's no, no difference between what is intracellular and extracellular. A more uh, better condition uh, would be to assess the cells by themselves. So you take the cells, uh, spin them down, put them in an NMR tube, and just take the extra. Um, so here is a study from uh, none other than Carlos Aris, uh, showing uh, that, the, um, that not only that you can assess these cells, uh, but you can also assess these, um, the changes or dynamic changes uh, in, the, in the cells over a period of time. Uh, so here they showed how uh, lipid uh, resonance has changed um, uh, over a period of time. So basically, as I said, uh, you, you take the cells and put them in the NMR tube. So like cell extracts, uh, the problem is that you are looking at the homogeneous populations of cells. So again, not a, the human condition. Going to subcutaneous models, uh, this is a phosphorus NMR study uh, from the uh, late 80s. Uh, where again, as I mentioned, these tumors are less perfused and hence become very hypoxic. So if you just let the tumors grow, uh, you would hardly see any AGP, uh, a very high PI peak, uh, and it's highly acidic tumor. However, if you treat it with BS BCNU, uh, you see that uh, the tumor maintains its energy levels, the PI is low, and you can also see the PME and the PDE peaks. So uh, what about the orthotopic tumors? Of course, if I'm uh, giving a talk, uh, I have to be selfish and talk about my own work. 
Uh, so this is the study from uh, my postdoc days, uh, where we showed that in this uh, glioma model called BT4C uh, that was transfected uh, to uh, express thymidine kinase, uh, if uh, treated with gancyclovir, uh, showed uh, a decrease in, in choline, but not only that, uh, over the period of time. Uh, and if you did diffusion-weighted spectroscopy, uh, that the uh, diffusion of choline was less. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that the cell death was an apoptotic cell death mechanism. And when in apoptosis, our cells would shrink, and if the cells are shrinking, then the diffusion uh, goes down. Compared to choline, the lipid peaks do not uh, express uh, much of the diffusion changes, but because uh, lipid or triglyceride molecules are, are more bound, and hence choline is a more freer molecule. Another marker that we also showed for apoptosis uh, during the similar studies was when we simply did uh, single voxel spectroscopy over a period of days, and what we noticed that uh, around day two of treatment, when the tumor was still growing, so uh, volume changes were less evident, uh, but what we saw was a very high increase in polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, which is, uh, we call them as a marker of apoptotic cell death. Uh, moving to another uh, example here for orthotopic tumor models, different tumor lines, uh, the normal side of the spectra always looks the same. Uh, high NA, creatine, choline, very similar to the human conditions. But if you look at the spectra uh, from the tumors, uh, they are different depending upon the tumor type that you are uh, looking at. Some are very, very aggressive, uh, have very high lipids and choline. The others would have less lipids, but higher uh, choline, for example. So again, reflecting the heterogeneity in GBMs that we are, are known about. PDX model is not a new thing. In fact, it's a very, very old uh, uh, method. And here is uh, an early paper from 1992, where they actually uh, developed a PDX model. That is, they took human tumors, astrocytomas, uh, put them in mice, uh, propagated them, and then extracted the tumors were then implanted in rats. And so basically now it's a human tumor growing in a rat. And um, spectroscopy studies here. So even though it's an older study uh, where the technology or the gradient strengths were not that great, um, so you see the spectrum from the normal side of, of the animal versus the tumor side. Um, what they show here is that there's higher lactate. Uh, so still, but I believe that the NA is probably coming from the contamination because the voxel is much, much larger here. Oh, there you go. So choline goes down uh, in, in, in recent cases as well. If you have an IDH mutant um, tumor, uh, you can see changes in glutamate, diffusion changes uh, as well, uh, that when the tumor responds early, you see diffusion changes when it doesn't, uh, ADC remains the same. Um, CBB high in, in animals and in, in, in humans, especially because of dilated vessels. You can look at tumor heterogeneity and uh, tumor habitats using DCE MRI. And in the chick embryo model, as I said, you implant tumors just in the CAM membrane. You see the tumors grow. You can do MRI. And you can actually see that's the tumor, and here's the vessels feeding um, the tumor. You can extract, uh, process the data, and you can actually see that the blood vessel volume uh, in the tumor, or that's the feeding the tumor, is higher than the normal unimplanted uh, tumors. So in summary, uh, DBM models uh, play an important role in understanding uh, biology progression, of, uh, as well as resistance in glamours. And as I said before, although no model is perfect uh, in replicating all aspects, each model has its advantages and limitations. They play an important role in development of drugs as well as understanding disease biology. But the key take home message is that the choice of model should depend upon the scientific question being asked 
rather than simply being dismissive about saying that uh, this will never work in humans. Uh, with that, I would end and acknowledge all the people that contributed as well as the funding agencies. Thank you.